Thanks for coming to the Spine Conference. Today's discussion uh, will be uh, acute low back pain with a normal x-ray. So that's a track of Joaquin, so I don't think I don't think we're gonna get hit at all. So we'll um, this is the first case, 25-year-old man with acute low back pain. He lifted a dresser up in his home uh, and um, had uh, severe immediate pain in his lower back. No sciatica, he can't move. Um, he cannot put on his socks on. Um, and his MRI scan shows um, mild, uh, what does MRI scan show, Aaron? Um, decreased signal, maybe L5S1. Mm-hmm. Okay, so and his x-ray is normal. So this is a very typical case uh, of what most people have low back pain for, is a disc problem. Uh, is a, and it's a mild degenerative disc disease, although the MRI findings are mild and usually patient's uh, symptoms for the rest of his life will be mild. At that point in time when he's standing in front of you, his symptoms are very, very severe. So the patient gets very upset when you tell him that you have a very mild problem and yet he can't put his socks on because how can this problem that's so bad that I can't put my socks on. Good morning, Dr. Allen. Good morning, Dr. Sturm. Um, how can this, uh, so today's uh, discussion is um, acute low back pain with a normal x-ray. You start on time, did you? Well, you got to start on time. And um, so this is the first case, 25-year-old um, man, acute low back pain, lumbar degenerative disc disease, which is the most common problem. A and, you know, 85% of all people have low back pain from the disc disease. Uh, it improves. Uh, you have bouts in your lifetime. Megan, what do you do for people like this exact person, 25-year-old man, low back pain? He can't put his socks on. Well, I usually start with stretching activities to get them to supine just to try and get them moving um, a little bit in their pain-free range and then progress to work on body mechanics on why he did that in the first place, which was lifting the dresser probably improperly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so changes behaviors. So this is the standard thing for low back pain, and we're not. Good morning, Christina. We're not going to um, go over too much of that, but that's the most common problem. And just as a um, refresher, the symptoms can come from any one of these discs in the lower back, and any one of these facets in the lower back. So at each level, at each disc level, there's also two facets, and any of these joints can cause pain, and there's a lot of them. Uh, yeah, if you can. If you're like our Vanna White. That one, that one. So any of these discs can get cause severe pain, and any of these facets can cause pain. So there's a lot of areas that can be painful in the spine. But they're usually not a serious problem. Like I would say 90% of the time, it's just transient, goes away. You just have to reassure the patient. But the disc itself is not innovative, is it? The disc itself is very richly innervated. Oh, okay. That's the whole problem. It's, uh, it's um, direct central uh, mm -hmm. in our bodies, and it's, when you get it, it's very disconcerting. Uh, the outer portion of the disc is innervated. The inside is not innervated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so the periphery, so you get the tears in the annulus, which is in the periphery. Um, uh, inside, there's no innervation whatsoever. So it's just like bones. Bones, the outside is, is richly innervated, the periosteum. Mm -hmm. The inside of the bone is not. So if you can numb the periosteum, you can drill through bones without pain. Okay, yeah. In this case, the pain was immediate while he was li lifting the dresser? Um, you saw him and then it just kept getting worse. So you have an injury, and just like all injuries, then you have an inflammatory response, which takes a couple days. That's why when we do surgeries, that night of surgery, they're like, it's not so bad. And then the next day, like, oh, and the next day, oh, it's worse. And then by three days, it's like, oh, I'm a little better now. So there's an inflammatory response to all injuries. Okay, so this is case two. And you guys can interrupt me if you have any questions. Case two is a, now is, is an older man, 45-year-old man with acute low back pain after picking up a pencil. And he had a history of mild low back pain for 20 years. So what do you see on the MRI, Aaron? Um, it's a different well, case. Well, bulges at every level. The arrow is pointing at something. Yeah, the arrow helps. <laughs> the arrow always helps. Well, there's a spinal cord compression. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so there's severe, there's severe um, um, uh, fecal sac uh, compression. Uh, from a disc bulge and also posteriorly there's ligament and flavum hypertrophy. So this this patient also had a normal x-ray 
But this is sort of a different case. He does have lumbar degenerative disc disease as well, but he also has concomitant spinal stenosis, so it's a little bit more complicated. And nevertheless, these people <coughs> usually get better as well, but he may need uh, uh, like um, neurosurgical decompression uh, to help him long term. So this is sort of a different problem, but same presentation. Can I make one comment? Yeah. That didn't happen from picking up the pencil, right? Huh? That didn't happen from picking up the pencil. That was just maybe the exacerbating. Well, I, I, what do you think, Megan? I mean, I think that that's a common um, theme of people who have back pain transient through their lifetime, and it's just one little episode, they picked it up, they turned a little bit wrong, and probably bulged a little bit more. It depends on how you, your philosophy of life is like, you know, how far back you want to go and uh, if you want to create a life story. But most patients like to have life stories, you know. So the, fe the, pencil, the pencil caused it. But he did have a problem. He had pre coexisting, pre existing inclination. So is the curvature normal from the Yeah. The disc the oh, no, they shouldn't have a bulging disc like that. That's abnormal. But okay, uh, the vertebral. Uh, oh, yeah, lower doses is that's, no that's mostly normal. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so I think it's important to have um, to know what the red flags are. So you may say, well, should I never worry about patients with low back pain? No, there's definitely some things that are red flags in medicine, which you should be very concerned with, is um, pain at night, nocturnal pain, pain at rest, and improves with when activity. So when they're when they're reading a book or when they're relaxing, and then once they, they start doing, they have pain, and once they start doing things, it goes away. Uh, progressive neurological deficit, obviously if your foot or arm is getting weaker or things are dragging, that's a serious problem. Or if you're suspicious for a cancer or an infection. So uh, I'll go through, there's a, there's a certain thing called the gate, con gate control theory for pain. So um, while, um, how about, Alan, what painful things do you have right now? Me? Yeah. Well, I have a little bit of low back pain. Do you have right now? Low back pain. Me too, actually. I have yeah. like right now my... I mean, it's kind of mild. I can feel like a spasm. But it's so, a big ache, not, not real pain. Right, it's not bothering you, right? But it's there. Yeah. So, but, but you didn't even notice it five, a minute ago when you were talking to me because you were focusing on the case and looking mm -hmm. at the neurological stenosis. So, so our brain can very easily um, be distracted, so to speak, from pain. So the, the afferents, the neurological inputs to our brain from different parts of our body come from different nerve fibers. So the pain fibers are the A beta fibers, they carry the pain, and it doesn't, the, the nerve doesn't go straight to the brain, it goes, it has to go to the highway to the brain and the spinal cord. And also, there's other things that, the other nerve fibers that go at the same time, like for example, I put my belt on really tight this morning, and that's irritating me a little bit, but I don't feel like changing it, because once I stand up, I'm gonna need it. So that's bothering me too, that abnormal sensation. But that's a different sensation. That's, a, that's not a painful sensation. It's like, um, it's just a, a, a different fiber. Mm. Good morning, Doug. So that, these two competing inputs are going to my spinal cord. And then within the spinal cord, there, there are certain gates that turn things on and off. And I, my belt, which is a little bit too tight, is taking away the, um, is taking the place of the low back pain for me and I just feel the belt not the low back pain so things compete at the spinal cord that get to the brain so there's a gate theory so to speak so another way another way to example is um, let's say Brian's um, is hammering something and he hits his finger by accident what's your natural impulse you, huh sure. you pull back that's from the spinal cord reflex and then what do you do to your hand where it was hit you grab it you grab it and you like rub it yeah. right you rub it and why is that? So how how's that? How's that? If you know this theory now, how's that work? Why do you do that? It's an imp it, we all know that it's instinct. It makes the pain go away. Could you call it? Yeah. Well, you're you're giving yourself another sensation by rubbing mm -hmm. it, so that distracts the spinal cord from the the noxious uh, stimulus from the injury, and it takes the pain away. So we do it for a reason. So that that's how the gate. So during the day. When uh, you know Aaron's at work and I'm pestering her and I'm giving her extra work and this, the work never stops, her her like hip pain or whatever doesn't bother her. <laughs> but then when she's at home trying to relax, her hip starts to hurt. So when patients say that they have pain at night, we have to we uh, we have to think that you know they have a serious problem. They have some kind of bone, a deep bone problem. Um, so. 
this is just another diagram that shows on the bottom on the bottom left you see the nerve fibers going into the spinal cord and then they go up they ascend to the brain and they can be turned on and off by different gates <coughs> you want to add anything to that Doug about the um, gate theory of pain or nocturnal pain as an orthopedic surgeon that's how uh, stimulators work you about yeah tens yeah so tens units so um, and the spinal cord implantable stimulators yeah one patient said it best to me I said to him does, does that thing work does the spinal stimulator does it work how's it work and he was a very straightforward guy, smart guy. He said, you know, it feels like there's a swarm of bumblebees all over my body when I, when I crank it up. And when the bumblebees are on me, the pain doesn't bother me as much. And uh, <laughs> noise. Yeah. The noise are buzzing. There was like it's one, one buzz for another. Yeah. So, so it's interesting. So, um, so when should you have a high index, index of suspicion of a serious problem with a patient with low back pain? And a normal X-ray history, a history of cancer, which you know, as as patients get older, there's a much higher incidence of cancer. So, we always have to consider that osteoporosis, uh, um, steroid people on steroids, like rheumatoid uh, immunosuppressed patients, uh, um, ankylosing spondylitis patients. Uh, we have high net index suspicion of a fracture because their their spine is totally uh, stiff. Ten out of ten pain. Um, you know, we have, I think as physicians, uh, caregivers, we have, uh, we have a certain sense that this is a serious pain. Um, unexplained weight loss, an IV drug abuser uh, always can have an abscess. Uh, and someone with a uh, concurrent uh, urinary tract infection may have an abscess. Um, so what things, uh, other red flags is you have to um, be concerned with cardioclinic syndrome. A quadriquinous syndrome with low back pain is, by definition, three things. S severe low back pain, sciatica, number one. Uh, number two is um, perineal anesthesia or saddle anesthesia. Uh, and number three is um, abnormal bowel and bladder control. So the quadriquina is the horse tail, so to speak, in the lumbar spine, which goes through bowel and bladder control. And if you imagine if so yourself, if you were crazy, painted a saddle, sat on it <laughs> naked, and then got up and looked where the pain is, that's where patients get anesthesia uh, from um, quadriquinus syndrome. Uh, and um, you can see um, on the far right, the um, sacral segments innervate the, um, the buttocks in the anal area. And um, it's, it's, it's hard to know if your bowel bladder controls are working sometimes, because sometimes people just have urinary retention and they get these huge bladders and they slightly leak. Uh, and that's the only thing you find other than the numbness. But the numbness, I think, is very, very consistent. And the reason why this is a very serious thing not to miss is um, it could be permanent. So if you lose your bowel block control or you're numb in your perineal area permanently, it's a serious problem. So that's another red flag that you cannot ignore. So perineal anesthesia is the simplest. Other things you can do is you can do a voiding test, um, but that you need a test and you need an ultrasound. And you can do a rectal exam. These people are likely to be referred to your role then usually I'm being lucky to pick up the diagnosis. They usually don't. They usually go to the ER because of the pain. So the people that ignore uh, the people that ignore urinary retention are older people because they think they're just getting old. They're like wetting their pants and okay, my grandmother had this problem. Maybe I have it now. Um, uh, so they ignore. Like we we saw a patient the other day. Remember, she had two weeks of wearing a diaper. She was 65. Two weeks wearing a diaper, and she thought she was just getting old. Um, and she had vaginal numbness, and for two, for like vaginal numbness for a month, and it wasn't. It, she came to the ER because of pain, mm -hmm. and she just ignored um, the numbness and the uh, urinary retention. Remember, and we did the surgery emergently, even though it really wasn't a totally emergent problem. It was like a one-month problem, but I figured I should do it emergently, and everything went away: the uh, perineal anesthesia and the um, bladder control problem. So, so any questions about quadriquinus syndrome? Yeah. It is time sensitive though. If you present with it, you want to get surgical intervention as quickly as possible. You want to do this. It's not an emergency like a gunshot wound to the right. chest, um, but you want to do it very soon, like next day or you know the next in in a one or two days. Within 24 hours is optimal, uh, but it's not a complete emergency. Um, so these are the this is the differential diagnosis of back pain. We're going to go over them: pregnancy, pregnancy with labor, menstrual spirit, urinary tract infection, cholecystitis, pancreatitis aneurysm, we'll go through all of them. 
So this is a, a CAT scan uh, of the abdomen, and in the middle where there's a P is the pancreas, and the pancreas is inflamed, irregular. So pancreatitis um, is a cause of low back pain. Doug, have you ever diagnosed pancreatitis in the office? No? I have uh, twice, two or three times, actually. Um, and a uh, patient had um, one month, I remember he was a 65-year-old male, one month history of low back pain in my office, and um, he was holding his belly, and I, and I just, and I asked him, does your belly hurt? He goes, yeah, my belly hurts too, but that's a different problem because I have dyspepsia or something. And he had severe pain with the palpation of his abdomen. It turned out his uh, lipase and amylase was very high. So the pancreas, any retroperitoneal anatomical structure can, um, can radiate to the lower back and present as low back pain to the orthopedic surgeon's office. And um, other, um, other uh, things they get is abdominal pain worse when they eat. Uh, they lean forward, nausea, vomiting, tenderness, indigestion, loss of weight. But sometimes it just presents as low back pain. Uh, so the way to make the diagnosis is a serum amylase or lipase uh, and get imaging. Alan, do you want to add anything to that, pancreatitis, low back pain? You look for history of alcohol or other things like that. Alcohol, uh, mm -hmm. uh, certain medications. Cholol uh, gallstones, yeah. Lipid hyperlipidemia? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, gallstones, known gallstones maybe. Um, so another, uh, episode, uh, another thing called low back pain is uh, pregnancy. So an early pregnancy, I mean labor, I mean uh, people know uh, there people, if someone, if, if a person's uh, a large pregnancy that comes to the so office is low back pain, and you have to be suspicious of that. Usually people know they're in labor. Or a menstrual spirit can cause uh, low back pain. Another thing caused low back pain is urinary tract infection. Um, uh, and um, we've diagnosed a couple of urinary tract infections, so low back pain. Uh, it's usually flank pain, but they usually have a fever, malaise, uh, high white blood cell count. Um, they have um, uh, urinary frequency, urgency. But sometimes uh, patients present to the ER with a urinary tract infection, they're just confused and they have low back pain. Have you seen that, Doug? Have you guys yeah. seen? Very often. You want to add anything to that uh, urinary tract infection? No, I mean, it's, it's more lateral than... Usually the flank. It's axial central. Yeah. 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 It's usually flank. Yeah. But not everybody goes by the rule book. Some people no. are dead center low back pain. Another uh, is cholecystitis that can um, present as low back pain. I remember um, I diagnosed my mother's friend in her home with cholecystitis because she, she said she has to see me in the office for low back pain. I just asked her just a couple questions and, um, and uh, she had uh, cholecystitis. Usually they have right upper quadrant pain that radiates to the lower back, but sometimes it can just be back pain and they sometimes can have nausea, vomiting, anorexia, fat intolerance, abdominal distension. And the key portion of the exam is the Murphy sign. Uh, Murphy's arrest sign. So when you push in the right upper quadrant, tell them, tell them to take a huge deep breath. The li the lungs expand, so the liver goes down and the gallbladder goes down, and your hand then hits the gallbladder, which is inflamed, and it causes inspiratory arrest. They stop the breathing because it hurts. Have you di has anyone diagnosed uh, cholecystitis? Hmm? Has anyone here diagnosed cholecystitis? Sure. Yeah. Many times, yeah. So these are all low back pain. Um, um, so this is um, uh, low back pain, which um, the findings showed an abdominal aortic aneurysm. And I've diagnosed actually one case. It was a friend of a friend's wife who was only 25 years old. And um, I looked at the MRI and it was an aneurysm. And I was shocked. I mean, I, I just couldn't believe it. I sent her to the ER. I was so worried about her. I thought maybe she was dissecting. Um, and she had some kind of familial predisposition to get these things. But a abdominal aortic aneurysm can present as low back pain. Again, anything in the retroperitoneal space can give can refer to the lower back. Anybody want to comment on uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm? She, uh, she eventually had it um, removed at Hopkins. Um, peptic ulcer disease, can, again, can radiate to the lower back. So. Um, uh, patients, you know, could have also vomiting, uh, nausea, uh, stress, um, uh, uh, pain um, uh, two to three hours after they eat. But sometimes it's just low back pain. 
and uh, I won't get into gastric ulcer. Another common one with severe low back pain is um, nephrolithiasis. So that, that um, when, pa when patients are doubled over and have like a spastic component to their lower back, it could be just that. And uh, I've seen that many times in the office. And when patients, uh, they're out, they're, uh, they had low back pain, they usually have abdominal pain too on exam. Uh, I know that orthopedic surgeons, we're very reluctant to touch anything other than the extremity sometimes. Um, but um, you know, you'll help the patient if you can uh, uh, palpate that. I usually send them to the ER because I'm not sure what it is if they have an acute abdomen. Um, diverticulosis and diverticulitis also can cause low back pain. And I think the differentiator is they could have a fever, uh, and they also have pain with uh, deep palpation of the right of the left lower quadrant usually. Anybody want to add diverticulitis? Pelvic inflammatory disease um, can be a cause of low back pain. Uh, they just have to be basically um, a sexually active uh, woman, uh, but they could they usually have a, a fever. But sometimes it can be just a, just a chronic indolent uh, low back pain. So ankylosing spondylitis can cause low back pain too. So this is this is a uh, ankylosing spondylitis. You can see the sacroiliac joints are totally fused and the spine's totally fused. This is an obvious diagnosis and this is late. I don't think the late people get low back pain. The people who get low back pain are the early people. The the young man, like 30 year old man, uh, has low back pain. And um, if you look at the MRI quickly, it's normal. Um, most of these people, I think 90 percent of these people, HLA B27 positive. Uh, they present as young people. Uh, a bone scan can be very obvious, and if you get an MRI scan of the sacroiliac joint, you can make the diagnosis of the erosive uh, changes, subchondral erosive changes of the SI joint, usually more on the iliac side, um, and also like synovitis of the sacroiliac joints. But when you get an MRI of the lower back, they don't always show the SI joint. So, um, I mean, maybe we should put that in, in, in when we uh, but usually they get come to us with an MRI. So, and that's something just to consider. We diagnose uh, ankylosing spondylitis patients frequently, I think. I mean, not one of them, maybe one every three months or so. And these, they can have normal MRI scans other than the sacroiliac joint. And they're usually early cases, so the x-rays look normal. So anybody want to add to that? Um, Lyme disease can cause any kind of joint pain, low back pain, um, and they can they just have like flu-like symptoms sometimes. Hyperparathyroidism um, can cause low back pain from sacroiliitis. So the symptoms of hyperparathyroidism are very non-discreet: insomnia, irritability, don't feel well, lack of appetite, uh, arthralgias, muscle weakness. On the right there, you can see a Brown's tumor, which is. Um, not common, but they can have it, have it, and they can have erosive changes of the sacroiliac joint. So this CAT scan was from a patient of mine who had L4, L5 spondylolisthesis, and um, and I performed the spinal fusion for low back pain because she had an obvious problem, and she never did be she never did well. She goes, doctor, thank you very much for the surgery. It's been a month now, but I don't feel any better at all, zero. I was like, well, what, well, why is that? So I got a CAT scan just to see if the uh, screws were in a good position or something, and it showed uh, sacroiliac erosive changes. It, so it turned out she had hyperparathyroidism, 50-year-old woman. Um, unfortunately, she had also a concomitant spinal problem, which could totally explain the same symptoms. So she had the workup and she had the uh, adenoma removed. So before you do back surgery, what screening do you do on everybody? Well, I don't... Would, would you normally do calcium and phosphorus? No. no. Mm -mm. So I think that's the problem with hyperparathyroidism is that it's a very difficult diagnosis mm. to make unless you're thinking of it. Um, if everything looks normal, if everything looks normal mm -hmm. and I do the screening, I do send people for hyperparathyroid hormone uh, and if they have other constitutional symptoms. All you have to do is calcium and phosphorus. Calcium and phosphorus. <coughs> calcium and phosphorus. Yeah. Yeah. Is the pain in the erosion of that SI joint from micro motion, or, or is it like arthritic pain? The, the pain. Why is it painful? It's just it's erosive into okay. the bone, so it causes probably an inflammatory response, it's and that causes. Some, uh, okay. Did she improve after having the yeah. surgery, and like her 
body. She you know, her she eventually did fine. Yeah, eventually okay. she, she did fine. Yeah. So, uh, other things can cause low back pain are psychosocial issues like fear, anxiety, financial problems, anger, depression, job dissatisfaction, family problems, stress. <laughs> that's that's Erin after a very long day with me, like 12 hours of surgery. <laughs> she goes home. That's what she does. She just can't deal it's with it anymore. Job, yeah. Huh? <laughs> so, uh, depression. I mean, we um, we see a lot of. Um, depression I think and just the uh, DSM-4 criteria for depression they can cause you know, exacerbated low back pain depressed mood uh, diminished interest in pleasure anhedonia uh, weight changes insomnia agitation uh, fatigue loss of energy feeling of worthlessness uh, guilt um, ab abnormal abnormal concentration decisiveness and recurrence thoughts of death or suicide if you get five of these symptoms for at least two weeks that's um, diagnosis for major depression so any questions up until this point a little back pain okay so here's some two interesting cases I'd like to show this is a consult in the hospital 66 year old um, female with low back pain and uh, she's claustrophobic so because she's claustrophobic she, she will not go in the MRI scanner she goes I can't do it it feels like a tomb etc and uh, she has x-rays, which were not helpful because um, of her body habitus. There's a lot of fat near her hips, which obscures the x-ray. And they did order a CAT scan, which is easy to get in the ER, which shows grade 2 spondylolisthesis. So the, the, uh, everyone just figures, you, can you see this patient? Low back pain, spondylolisthesis, no big deal. She's here for a urinary tract infection. Maybe follow up as an outpatient. But she had a fever. So... Um, Doug, would you order an MRI on this, or just what would you do in this case? I mean, CAT scan, no severe. She's got normal neurologic findings. No neurological findings, no motor sensory deficits, <coughs> just back pain. Um, she won't get out of bed in this CAT scan. Emergency mm. uh, L5S1 fusion. No, that's a joke. No, she's got. Um, she's got. Almost like she's almost got spinal optosis where her uh, <clears throat> lumbar vertebral body is off her sacrum. Yeah, it's sliding there. I mean, that it can cause low back pain. Yes, it looks like it's chronic. She's got a looks sort of old, yeah, a large spur in front of it. She's got no joint, but um, yeah, so this very likely could explain the whole thing. asking me something. I guess I'm, I yeah, it's a trap. Something else. It's a yeah. trap. <laughs> the conferences are, are always traps, and, <laughs> I, and, and I, in my um. You know, uh, but there is there are other imaging rather than an MRI. Yeah. Um, you can do a CT myelogram, but you may, if you're suspicious of an infection, you may be sticking a needle into an abscess. I mean, it's a problem. Well, I'm gonna cut. The, I'm gonna cut to the chase. I just. Um, There's an air density hmm? area between L5 and S1. Yeah. I mean, so that could be the cause of low back pain. That's it. That's not an emergency. So maybe just give the woman some antibiotics and send her home. Well, why would they air there? Oh, there's a, that's just a degenerative disc. They get air. It's like a vacuum. So, so I'll just keep going. Is that, so? What I did is I just forced her to get in the MRI, I, or co coerced her, whatever you want to call it. Gave her a bunch of Valium. She did get into the scanner. Most people, 99% of people, will go into the scanner if you coerce them. And yeah, she had a uh, she had an abscess. And um, I'll show you uh, where the abscess is. She did have this problem here, but she had she had an abscess. See the pus right there? And this pus here and this pus there in the spinal canal. And um, um, so there's pus in the spinal canal dorsally. And also um, on the axial cuts, um, you can see the spinal canal. The nerves are all clumped right there because there's pus anterior and posterior in the fecal sac. So this was a much more serious problem than just uh, L5S1 spondylolisthesis. It was an epidural abscess. And the only index suspicion I had was, look, this woman has an active, uh, she's got an active infection going on here, urosepsis. This could be an abscess on top of the um, spondylolisthesis. So you need an MRI scan to be sure. And um, I mean, sure enough, it was the issue. What so about, um, you know, um, lumbar puncture up with that diagnosis? 
Uh, probably, yeah. You probably see white cells, but MRI is better. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to do surgery too, you need the MRI. So, the best thing is just put the woman in the scanner somehow, a coerce or a sedation, etc. So she had it. This is where the abscess was on the left, and this is the surgery. I did a uh, L2 complete L3 laminectomy, partial L4, and at L4 or 5 a partial laminoframinotomy decompression opened her spinal canal, and she did wonderful. Next, wonderfully. The next morning, she felt better. So if you once you remove the abscess, people have dramatic improvement, and probably you know back to her. Uh, Low back pain, chronic low back pain. So this is another case. Six so what grew out of the abscess? Yeah. Same thing as the, the urine. Was she sick? Yes, and, same uh, thing. Same thing. Blood yeah. Blood I think it was E. coli. Same thing. Mm -hmm. So it all corresponded. Um, so just drain that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Open it, drain it. Yeah. Just so just give the give the uh, space. Give the space. Uh, uh, um, uh, 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 the abscess basically a place to go, and it just goes into the. Um, it leaves and then they're fine. It doesn't take much. You just have to open it up. Um, and that's so all I've seen at university too. When I was at university, a man, a 25-year-old man, kept coming to the ER for two for two weeks, like every day. Finally, one uh, ER attending said um, he, he just got an MRI and he had a big abscess. And um, and uh, I just opened, did a laminectomy, and left it open because I wasn't sure if he'd ever come back. Um, and he just walked out the next morning. Uh, next morning he was brushing his teeth with his absent, with his back wound open and just brushing teeth. He's like, Dak, I just wanted to brush my teeth and I'm going to see you later. And he just walked home and never saw him back. So they do well. Once you decompress the pus, they do great. Um, so this is a 65 year old man. When you say you left it open, what did you leave open? I left the wound open. So if you could, you could theoretically stick your finger all the way into this man and comp and touch his nerves. It's like a, it was a, you know, it's a four inch uh, incision. But I left it open so all the pus will come out. Yeah. It closed, it closes quickly. <laughs> you could, you can do it, trust me on this. So this is another 65 year old man with, with recurrent low back pain. He's had two previous kyphoplasties and he has basically a normal x-ray other than the cement. But the MRI shows you he has a new fracture now at L5. But you wouldn't have known that without the MRI. And he just can't move. He says he can't deal with it, and despite pain medicines, brace, etc. So um, I take him back. Um, I take him for a kyphoplasty. He does well. And then he comes back the next week. He gets my back hurts again. And he's got a new fracture at L4. So I take him back a, a, another time and put more cement. So I mean, this man has some kind of, I sent him for biopsies. I did a big workup. I could never un figure, understand why he kept fracturing, why he, you know, he had this unexplained osteoporosis. I never understood it. It wasn't a tumor. I was worried it was myeloma, but it never happened. He had some kind of problem, but he, he, he said he did great from the kyphoplasties and he wanted it. Um, so it could be a um, insufficiency fracture, which and the X-ray looks normal. Um, another thing could be is diffuse metastatic involvement of the vertebral bodies uh, with a normal X-ray. Um, usually, those patients have some other constitutional sign or symptom. They they are fatigued or they don't feel right. Or um, another thing could be is an epidural abscess. This is a metastatic synovial sarcoma, where the X-ray looks normal and yet you have a massive involvement of the epidural space from soft tissue tumor compressing the thecal sac. So this is another case of a 48-year-old woman who's had a fusion and she had severe low back pain. <coughs> Nothing makes it better despite six months of swimming, nonsteroidals, physical therapy, muscle relaxers, opiates, injections. And she's had a previous L4 to S1 fusion for lumbar germ disc disease. And the CAT scan shows she's fused uh, on the left, but you can see on the right, she has acroiliac joint disease. So you can see here, the facets, the uh, sacroiliac joint now is very arthritic. And if you fuse the lumbar sacral junction, it causes sacroiliac joints to move more, and they become arthritic. And um, so that can be a cause of pain too, with a normal x ray. Anybody want to add anything to that side joint, arthritis?
you have people that are fused, you know, they get the lumbar fusion, then they get a sacral fusion, and then they just can't, I mean, then they're all locked up. Then they get hip disease they, sometimes. Yeah, right. I mean, it's just somewhere mm -hmm. the movement has to come from. Yeah. It's just things you have to take into consideration. And this is the last case. It's not low back pain, it's neck pain, but it's a very dramatic case. I wanted to show it. It's a 21-year-old man who presented to the ER, at, this was when I was at Mercy, 21 years old, with neck pain for three months, keeps going to the ER for narcotics, physical therapy. He just keeps telling them he feels clumsy, he doesn't feel right, and he, he says, I can't walk. And um, they keep giving him Percocets. He keeps coming back, it's like the Percocets aren't helping. I, I have pain and I can't walk. And the, all, the x-rays are always normal. So, think something's wrong with him? Huh? Yes, myelopathy. Yeah, so his MRI shows ex he has developmentally small spinal canal and severe spinal cord compression. This man's only 21 years old. You can see the spinal canal is small and should look like that. You can see his spinal cord is severely compressed. So he should have like long track signs. He didn't have any. He didn't have hyper reflex or no. anything like that. You get those signs. You get those signs from after a long time. That's what they call long track signs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that has to be years. So this guy only had it for like months. The severe stenosis. No but neurologic findings. You don't think? Oh yeah, he had neurological findings. He had ataxia. He couldn't walk. Ataxia. He, he couldn't walk. He was stumbling. Upper extremities. Uh, mostly lower extremities, a little bit upper, mostly lower. Have you ever had a workup, like an EMG or anything like that? No. Just lots of x-rays from Percocet, huh? But yeah, he's just an ER guy. He's very simple. He's, yeah. like, he's a kid. He's a, yeah. you know, hmm. he's a downtown, inner city, poor kid. And uh, he's a good kid, though. And he wasn't a drug abuser, but... Did they ever CT him, you think? No, just uh, x-rays x in the ER. Hmm. So, um, it's actually a very, it's a very incredible case. I'll never forget it. So I did. I I took him to surgery. I was very. I was like, you know, shocked when I saw the MRI scan. So I took him to surgery the next day, and I performed um, just a laminectomy, uh, and did some foraminotomies because he was having some uh, arm symptoms. And um, he went home the next day. He says he felt be he felt better the next day. He just went home. He wanted to go home. And I just said, I said, I want you, he said, he said, thanks, I really appreciate it, doctor. And I said to him, you know what, if you, if you want to do me a favor, come back to see me in a year, because I want to see how you're doing. Because I was curious if, if all of his symptoms would go away. So he did. He came back a year, and he was a normal kid. He goes, oh, I run now, I run all the time for exercise, I work, I'm fine. Everything totally came back. The clumsiness, the, the weakness that he had. So... Um, it was an amazing. I didn't recognize him when I saw him when he when he came to see me because he was a uh, he was kind of like bedridden, and he just walked in. I was like, I don't remember you at all. He goes, No, no, I had this. I was like, Oh my God, that's you. It was like a, sh a shock. So, um, so what was the cause of this? Uh, he had a, he had a, you can see he had a developmentally small spinal canal, yeah. and then he had some disc disease, but because he has very little room for his nerves, uh, it caused yeah. severe uh, spinal cord compression. So this is like a classic case when someone plays football or gets into a car accident or something as a paraplegic that there was. The football ball. player gets paralyzed during the game and he comes back. Yeah. Those patients, those people have small spinal canals. I'm blanking on the name, but there were a couple of famous guys who, uh, you know, who had a. Transient quadriplegia. Well, they have chronic, chronic, you know, neck pain, neck pain, neck pain, normal X-ray, and then boom, they're paralyzed. There's. Some guy, he's got a son who went to Citadel or something like that. But it comes back. No, no, this guy's a permanent. Permanent paralysis. Yeah, when I mean, you're playing NFL, you're. Yeah, but some a lot of NFL players are temporary, so quadri. Right, so it's like burners, stingers, and. It's basically a stinger of the spinal cord. And then when do you uh, when do you say? I, I don't know if you heard, but last week there was a, a kid in New Jersey who was killed playing football. It's quarterback. Took a couple of rough hits, walked off on his own, collapsed and died. The reason I know is because I had to drive to New York for a funeral, so I'm driving on the Jersey Turnpike, and that's all you hear on the news. Yeah. And then coming back, it turned out that he had a um, a ruptured spleen. All oh, right. And so they said, you know, he, he may have had a swollen spleen, you know. So, uh, you know, looking into that, he, he probably had mononucleosis yeah, or yeah. something. 
and supposedly that's like a contraindication to contact sports. Contact sports having yeah. mononucleosis, and it's sort of a you know like when it's always a question uh, you know if a little kid when do you watch him for a pro hockey player who has a splenic injury when do you let him go back to play or lacrosse player it's hard to feel the spleen. So you're going to do CAT scan these kids? You know, right. So the question is, when do you, um, not only that, you know, when do you, if you know he has mono, when do you let him go back to play? Or what kind of screening should be done for a football team? You know, if I guess an ultrasound. If someone has mono and you, he's got a large spleen, you got to make sure that spleen goes down. The patient can die. That's a big, uh, that's, <coughs> I don't know if you, if you, but that's why my insurance company, a lot of insurance companies now uh, don't let orthopedic surgeons treat pro athletes. Because we miss uh, systemic disease? Well, like in, in no, like in Philadelphia, if, you know, because what happens is if you screw up or if something happens, like in Philadelphia, this guy had a stress fracture of his foot that, you know, he, he had it fixed with a screw, big guy, like seven something, he breaks the screw. So he's out for a year, so he sues for loss of wages. Mm -hmm. And, you know, his wages are like, you know, $7 million a year or something. Yeah, you know? they're high stakes. So the question is, you know, sh you know, the, the guy was sort of found that he should have used a bigger screw or something like that. So now <clears throat> none of your insurance companies allow you to treat pro athletes, and that's why these teams have team physicians, and the team physicians are actually employed by the team, and you can't sue your employer for health care. So it's kind of a... Oh, that makes sense. Also, should be a team approach to these people. <laughs> Beginning after this case, when you say it's developmental, what does that mean for you? He was, he, he was born, he was born or developed a small spinal canal. So we all, we all have a, we all, our spinal canal should be like the size of a quarter. And obviously, when you're a baby, it's tiny, and then you yeah. grow to full, full growth. And if a man say 20 years old, from from the time you're born to the time you're 20. The tube never opened up. It just was always small. You think that was post-traumatic? Post, you know, the kid? Like, yeah. Like when he's, you know, developing, he's a teenager, 12-year-old or something, he has a, a, a cervical spine injury. No, I think I think it's just, he's, he's just a bad luck. He just had the joint just disease. Pure, right? Yeah. No yeah. family history. It's better to no. see the uh, axial cut. Uh, hmm? No, it's just it's just a disc disc herniations that because he's got no room for his spinal cord, it causes a serious problem. Adam Taliaferro was like famous Penn State football player. Mm -hmm. Adam Taliaferro is a politician now, but it happened in like two thousand. Took a hit, needed a helmet, ruptured, fractured C five, spinal cord bruise. I think he went to Hershey immediately, had a laminectomy, and recovered everything. It took a while for it to come back, but he's walking fully functioning. Went back to Penn State, graduate school, now he's in politics. But he went down on the field with a quad. Everybody thought he was never going to walk again or move his arms. Mm -hmm. He was in deep depression all came back. Yeah, well, yeah, but what we we're what we we're talking about, people have normal uh, normal X-rays, no fracture, just a tight spinal canal. Yeah, that's this. And and they get transient quadriparesis and and the uh, plegia, and it goes away. But the question <laughs> is, should you let these people play football? Got it. It's a very controversial subject. Apparently, you could let them go play football, but I mean, if it were me, but I'm not an NFL player. If I was in the NFL, I'd probably, I'd probably want to keep playing football, too. Yeah, you want to play football unless you're the one that becomes a quad. But you don't know that. And, th and then you say, you know, the doctor should have, you know, I saw, you know, I saw three experts, and they should have, you know, someone should have been smart enough to say, you know, my, no one ever said your risk is, you know, Nobody but, knows. Nobody knows what the exact risk is. People want to play football, they make a lot of money and they have fun. So they just kind of roll them the dice. All right, any other comments? Or? Uh, one of your things with the public inflammatory disease, once the infection is taken care of, if people are still presenting with pain? No, it's a referred pain. Once the infection is cleared, the pain goes away. It's referred. Okay. Some, some people will see in pelvic floor physical therapy that will sort of have these chronic uh, pain 